Tony wanted another discussion about his future, or la grande stratégie as he now called it. The only question that mattered was whether it strengthened or weakened him. I veered to the lame duck side of the argument. I wasn't convinced it was remotely time for him to go yet. Tony said, in truth, I've never really wanted to do more than two full terms. I said, Christ, how much can I get from the press for this one? He smiled and said, is it the right thing or the wrong thing? I want your best brain on it. Then he laughed and said, there's another complication. I think Cherie's pregnant. He said they were both absolutely gobsmacked by the whole thing. He had known for a few days. It had clearly had an impact on his thinking about the Grand Projet. I slept really badly. Lots of different worries just floating around. As for Cherie being pregnant again, it was mind-blowing. Cherie had a miscarriage later that summer. Tony called as I was driving down to France to discuss Iraq and we agreed that we should start to push out some of the Saddam material. Blair is determined to prove to a sceptical public that Saddam does pose a real threat to the world. This imperative triggers a set of totally unpredictable consequences. Every step and the motives of all the main players from this moment onwards will be subject to forensic examination. Unaware of what he's setting in train, Blair announces that publication of the dossier on Iraq's weapons of mass destruction is imminent. We went through some of the hard questions on Iraq. The hardest was why now? What was it that we knew now that we didn't before? Tony said the debate had got ahead of us, so we were going to do the dossier earlier. Originally I had the intention um, that we wouldn't get round to publishing the dossier until we'd actually taken the, the key decisions. I think probably it's a better idea to bring that forward. Today was about beginning to turn the tide of public opinion, and it was going to be very tough indeed. They now begin to accumulate new intelligence material to bolster the case for military action against Saddam. Meeting with John Scarlett and others to go over the dossier. It had to be revelatory, and we needed to show that it was a new and informative part of a bigger case. Never before has Tony Blair made such an important trip across the Atlantic, and never before has he enjoyed such influence in Washington. He's arrived here to tell George W. Bush to internationalize the Iraq crisis, to get him to agree that the path to a possible war should go through the United Nations. At one point we had a break, and Bush shouted out across the room, Hey, big guy. Tony wasn't there at the time, but I went over and Bush said, I'll say this, your guy's got balls. He and I discussed our running. He'd done one marathon, and his mum and dad had come out to cheer him at 19 miles, and his mother had shouted, There are three fat ladies ahead of you. As we left, Bush choked to me. I suppose you can tell the story of how Tony flew in and pulled the crazed unilateralist back from the brink. Back in London, work continues on the Iraq weapons dossier. Stories are emerging that MI6 is worried about the political use of their intelligence material. I said I'll chair a group looking at it from the presentational point of view. John Scarlett thought there was an ownership issue. He said he must feel he has ownership of it. Then I did a note to John, copied very widely, setting out the process. John Scarlett to own, Alistair Campbell to help. I said the drier, the better. Cut the rhetoric. The more intelligence-based it was, the better. We had the basic story and now had to fill it out. Tony looked at it and felt it was pretty compelling stuff. I was worried that the dossier was going to be too assertive, that even though the agencies presented it as their work, 
it would be seen as us trying to spin them a line. All the stops were pulled out to get the dossier together for Blair to present it to Parliament. It concludes that Iraq has chemical and biological weapons, that Saddam has continued to produce them, that he has existing and active military plans for the use of chemical and biological weapons, which could be activated within 45 minutes, including against his own Shia population, and that he is actively trying to acquire nuclear weapons capability. The press seized on the drama of the 45-minute claim, which was accepted pretty much at face value. When accusations are later levelled at the government over the veracity of this claim, Campbell would be obliged to hand over his diary to a judicial inquiry. Then a call out of the blue to number 10 from the Cheshire Police. Are they aware that Cherie's friend, Carol Kaplan's boyfriend, Peter Foster, is a convicted con man facing deportation from the UK? I did a note for Tony saying the Foster story was clearly going to become public and that we had to have defensive lines ready, making clear he had never met him and that it was not true as he was saying that he was their financial advisor. Foster's claiming he represented Cherie Blair in buying two Bristol flats where the Blair's son is a student. Number 10 responds to the Mail on Sunday's list of questions, denying any contact with him. Prime Minister, good afternoon, sir. Do you regret your wife getting involved with Mr. Foster? An exchange of emails between Cherie Blair and Foster is then revealed by the Mail, completely contradicting Number 10's denials. Even though I'd half expected this, I was absolutely livid. We had given, in Tony's name, the clear impression that Foster was not their advisor, that these emails would show very clearly otherwise. Tony spoke to Cherie, and she agreed that we could make clear she alone was responsible for any misunderstanding. Campbell's taking the majority of the flack for something he had no control over. The papers were dire for Cherie while the Mail and the Telegraph were really going for me. These issues where the political and the personal collide were always difficult. Tony was getting very agitato. He said, I'm not having my wife treated like this and we have to fight back on the basis we've done nothing wrong. I felt that unless we let some air out of the situation, this was just going to go on and on. We were all now up for Cherie doing a big number. We went through things line by line. It was probably the best way to blow the storm out. I gave her the draft, and Peter Mandelson said she should pick out people in the audience and speak to them direct. How are you this evening? She looked at me and said, I certainly don't want to look at him. My immediate instinct, when faced with the questions from the Mail on Sunday, ten days ago, was to protect my family's privacy, and particularly my son, in his first term at university, living away from home. Sometimes I feel I'd like to crawl away and hide, but I will not. After the event, everyone felt a lot better. Tony said he was really proud of the way she stood up to it. The fallout from the Foster episode had, however, put a terrific strain on Blair and Campbell's relationship. Tony called as I was out on a run and said we just had to shut it down. I said to him the real problem was that whether you like it or not, you're linked to a con man. He said, I resent that. You are. You're married to a woman who is determined to protect and keep a woman who is in love with a con man, so you're linked to a con man. He shouted at me down the line, I am not linked to a con man. You are. And until Cherie dumps Carol, or Carol dumps Foster, or preferably both, that's the way it is. Tony was having none of it. We have a fundamental disagreement. You think Cherie has done something monstrous, and I don't. You think Carol is monstrous, and I don't. I said I wasn't going to defend Carol or anything to do with her. Fine. Don't then, just say nothing about it. Fine, I said, but if this goes on much longer, I'm off. 
out of here. Goodbye. <laughs>